On January the 14th of 2014, the Supreme Court will hear oral arguments in the Bellingham case. This is the first opportunity for the Supreme Court to revisit its 2011 decision in a case called Stern v. Marshall, a case which cast doubt on the constitutional authority of bankruptcy courts, which are constituted as Article I courts under the Constitution, to enter final adjudications in litigation uh, which is taking place before those courts. In Bellingham specifically, the case uh, raises a question of whether the bankruptcy court has constitu constitutional authority to hear and determine a particular species of claim called a fraudulent conveyance claim, and furthermore, whether litigants can consent to bankruptcy court adjudication of those claims. Aside from those uh, particular issues, uh, it is hoped, and indeed we expect, that the Supreme Court will take the opportunity to uh, revisit some of the broader questions that came out of the Stern versus Marshall case. To discuss the main questions at issue in Bellingham, I'm joined by the Honorable Judge Timothy Barnes of the US Bankruptcy Court for the Northern District of Illinois. Judge Barnes, courts exercising bankruptcy jurisdiction have since time immemorial decided fraudulent conveyance claims in bankruptcy proceedings in order to provide relief to creditors. Can you explain briefly why the Supreme Court decision in Stern versus Marshall has cast doubt on the constitutional authority of bankruptcy courts to determine these claims? The Stern decision presents an issue that is not unique to Supreme Court uh, opinions as a whole. Supreme Court opinions tend to speak in expansive terms regarding issues that sometimes are very narrow. In the Stern decision, the Supreme Court was faced with what was a very narrow factual determination, and that was, was a claim that was filed in a bankruptcy case and gave rise to a counterclaim by the debtor within the authority of the bankruptcy court to hear. Could the bankruptcy court go beyond the claim itself and hear the counterclaim, or was the bankruptcy court exceeding its authority in adjudicating a claim that was not arguably related to the underlying bankruptcy claim and was a matter that had to be determined by state law? The, the Supreme Court considered the issue, and it considered it in light of uh, a topic which is probate law that most bankruptcy courts steer clear of. And the Supreme Court's decision was not surprising. The Supreme Court found that the bankruptcy court had overreached its authority, but it went further. It actually said that the bankruptcy court had the authority when you look at the statute itself, but the statute itself was flawed in that it had given the bankruptcy court authority to act where the bankruptcy court as an Article I tribunal should not. So the ruling again was narrow, and in fact the, the very last sentence of the ruling said that it was narrow. But the decision in Stern was expansive as it described how the Supreme Court reasoned that claims such as these were beyond the authority of the bankruptcy courts. Its reasoning was so broad that it has given rise to disputes such as in Bellingham. So why are some courts saying that litigants can't waive the constitutional protection afforded by Article 3? Well, the real question is, again, if we go back to the public versus private rights, if, if it is determined by the court that a right to be heard in the Article I tribunal is a public right, the inquiry is essentially done at that point. But if it is, in fact, a private right, there is a further inquiry that has to take place. And, and the question is, is the protection afforded that right a, a, a protection that is personal to the individual who is afforded that protection, or is it a protection that is structural? Is the, is the protection there to protect various aspects of the entire system re regarding the Constitution, the separation of powers, and, and, and that sort of right? Now, if it is a personal right, if it is a right that is afforded just that individual, an example of a personal right would be a Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial, then that individual unquestionably can, can waive the right. They can, they can say, I'm not having, I'm, uh, not the right itself, but the protection. I'm, I'm not having that protection. I'll go forward and have the matter heard without a jury. But if it is a structural protection, then the, the individual should not be afforded the opportunity to waive that protection because it's there for broader reasons. It's there to protect Congress from overreaching, for example, and taking away from the Article Three tribunals their individual power, the power that was, by separation of powers, afforded them and not Congress. 
So in those instances, if it is in fact a structural protection, then any, any question over whether the, the right is waived, whether it be voluntary or uh, through implied action, uh, is, uh, is, is, is questioned by the courts. The courts have to ask, can, can that in fact happen? Because uh, it, it really does call into question the entire scheme. Can, can an individual, through its actions, whether it be through a, an actual active consent or whether it be through implied action by waiving, by failing to act, or by doing something else that implies that the, the, the protection is not needed that individual, can that individual actually give away a structural protection? And so I, the, the courts are split on the issue and Bellingham came down one, one way and other courts have understandably come down the opposite way. So the, the Supreme Court in hearing Bellingham will, we hope, give us, give us some guidance as to whether these rights are actual personal rights or structural rights. Thank you, Judge Barnes.